All right. I am live with Derek Hammon, CEO of uh, Workshop, right? Uh, I'm co-founder and chief uh, customer officer at Workshop. Workshop. Nice. And so you sold a company on my require for what, quarter million? Uh, yeah, a little more than that. Um, just under just under 300K. Nicely done. Did you buy oh, a Ferrari, you. a Lamborghini? Did you do anything cool? To- uh, I, I actually, I bought, I bought this watch. Uh, I'm like, I was like, I'm a cheapskate. And so I was like, I gotta have one thing to commemorate it. And so I bought a, you know, a nice ish watch, but you know, no, nothing crazy. And I was like, uh, you know, gotta have something to commemorate it. And, uh, literally the moment the money hit the bank, uh, I went out, uh, bought it, uh, like five minutes after the money hit the bank, bought it. And then immediately went to uh, transition the business over to the new buyer. So uh, I like for me, I was like, before the money hits the bank, I need to actually, or like when I, once I see it hit the bank, I don't want to spend it on other stuff. And so if I just kind of wrapped it into that transaction, it just like felt like I wasn't just like being stupid with, uh, with money. So uh, if the, if the, you know, the new watch just came out of the sale price and I was like, it looked like I just got a free watch among, uh, you know, kind of the other uh, parts of the, the deal. That's awesome. Well, tell me about the deal. Um, how did you, uh, how was your experience on microquire? How'd you find the buyer? Um, maybe just give me kind of like the, you know, five minute run through of like uh, posting, yep. talking with the buyer. We kind of just go from there. Yeah. So I okay, had kind of been a unique experience. Uh, so uh, uh, my previous company was Median. It was a two person bootstrap company, myself and my co-founder, Ben. Um, I was kind of on the sales and marketing side. Ben was a uh, uh, building up the entire product. Um, and, uh, we've been running the company for a couple of years. Uh, you know, we went for you know, a while without paying ourselves. Um, it was just kind of a niche, uh, product. It, it's a piece of um, software called co-browsing and we integrated with a bunch of, you know, live chat providers like, uh, live chat, intercom, Zendesk and, and those sorts of things. And, um, and along the journey, um, we had kind of done two different things uh, when it came to building the company, one of which was selling it um, as, you know, a $50 a month subscription as an add-on to your existing intercom account or whatever. Uh, and then we also white labeled the product. So we powered co-browsing under the hood for a number of chat providers like Olark and, um, and then a couple other ones that were based out of Europe. And uh, so we had kind of these two revenue streams, one of which people like were like knew they were buying um, median and the other of which were like Olark was essentially selling co-browsing as a power up. Um, and it just looked like Olark co-browsing. They didn't know that median even existed. And so we had these kind of two channels there. And then along the way, um, kind of later in the history of median, um, we ended up doing something unique, which I don't think a lot of people know about. And I didn't even realize it was, a um, something we could do was, uh, we got approached by, um, Two different companies in a short period of time. They're kind of large, now both publicly traded companies um, that were interested in doing kind of a white label version of co browsing. Um, and through a series of events, we ended up doing this kind of non exclusive perpetual licensing deal with them rather than doing a monthly subscription. And because we we're a bootstrap company, we had the freedom to just take one really big check. Um, and then uh, basically hand over a copy of our code base, knowing that it wasn't going to a competitor, um, knowing that we could still sell it to other customers and that sort of thing. So we did two of these really big perpetual licensing deals that were essentially an exit in and of themselves for us. And then, um, and then myself and my partner, Ben, were kind of interested in moving on to the next thing. And we had a bunch of money in the bank account. And we were kind of like, all right, well, we still actually own the business, like all of our customers, all of our contracts. Uh, what do we want to do next? And that's where uh, we actually, we found micro acquire. I don't know. I found I, you know, on Twitter or something. You're a beast on Twitter, uh, the, but like the, 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 the internet. <laughs> yeah. The internet. Found it on the internet. And, uh, <laughs> and it was interesting because we were like, well, we can keep this thing and keep cash flow in the background um, while we start the next business. Or um, it'd be interesting to test the waters and see if there's any interest for um, acquiring the company um, because it's still valuable. It's still a cool product. There's still revenue. There's still customers. There's all this other stuff, but we were just ready to move on. And um, so it came across micro acquire and um, cause I had looked at like other like potential brokers and we were like a small company, like kind of a not in the mindset of like, we're going to go hire a broker and give them 10, 15% of the fee or whatever the heck it is. I don't even know. And, um, and micro acquire is interesting. Cause I was like, Oh, like I can list this publish kind of like uh, our stuff anonymously. Uh, you can validate our financials and then people can 
basically like see if they're interested in it. And I just didn't know what I was going to do. All I knew is I didn't have to, I didn't even know I wanted to sell the company, but I knew that I might want to, if we get the right offer. And so I, I uh, was like, Oh, I showed it to my partner. I was like, this is really interesting. looks like I can set up a profile super fast. And then they just validated on the back end and um, see if there's interest. And that's what we did. And, and then, and then holy shit, like, I don't know if I can cuss on this, but like, holy shit, like, uh, I just got a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of people like reach out like super fast and had interest. And I was like, well, I guess we're doing this now. This is like, there's a lot of interest. Um, which was like the interesting thing for me too. It's just like, how do we even connect with people that would potentially be interested in acquiring your business in like a, like scalable way. And, um, I just, I just kind of lucked into finding micro acquire early on and then was interested in testing the waters. And I was, super surprised with the results in a positive way. So how long did it? Um, so I assume you talked to, you know, multiple buyers. Um, okay. You found, you found the one, okay. Yep. The one, the one that, you know, uh, maybe you're at LOI. How long did it take you to, um, get to that point? Yeah. So I think the timeline was we listed, uh, and then got a couple of, uh, responses right away. And then I think you sent out like the email newsletter, uh, like two days later, and then we got probably 15 buyers within the first three days that had messaged me and were interested. Um, and then over the course of the next week, I think we ended up having another um, 20 or 30. So I ended up with like 40 people who reached out. Um, it's been about a year now. Um, and then, uh, I had probably, and, and they asked for like, you know, let me, can I see some more financials? We had a, you know, a deck that we put together. Um, so I gave that to them. And then of those probably 40 total, um, I had like a zoom call with probably about 10 of them, uh, within, and I, and I was trying to move fast. Cause I was like, we either need to figure out if we're going to sell this or, or keep running it. I, and I want to move on quickly. Um, and so we had zoom calls with about 10 within the week. Um, all of those happened within a week of us listing. And then, um, of those about three of them, uh, four actually, um, gave some sort of like verbal offer or like, like, Hey, I'd be interested in this. I would like to figure out a way to make you an offer. Um, or at least, you know, put some sort of, um, LOI in place. And, um, so I ran a pretty tight process there and, uh, within, um, a week and a half, we had an LOI in hand. Um, and then, uh, we looked at it like, and we optimized actually not for top price. Uh, we optimized for, um, you know, getting the business transition out quickly. We had already started workshop our new company um, and we had some commitments there and that sort of thing. So um, we kind of optimized for like, what's a good price, a, a good home for it. Like who do we think is actually going to um, take care of this? And then, uh, and then also like what's going to allow us to kind of, you know, clear our minds of anything media and related and move on. And so um, from there on, I think, you know, we did due diligence was probably three or four weeks. Um, and then we, you know, we, we signed uh, an LOI, went back, did a month of due diligence. And then you know, a month later, we first check was in the bank and then we had a 60 day transition. And then um, the second check, which was the final check uh, was in the bank after 60 days. Nice. I, I really like how you focused on, focus on um, you know, terms and like the relationship, make sure. Um, Cause if you sell your company to someone that you just don't mesh with or something like that, you know, you probably have a lot of problems. So just, um, I, I like your approach of, you know, not optimizing for top dollar. Um, I did that with, um, business apps. I optimized for terms rather than a like, big earn out and stuff like that. So I'm totally on the same page with you on that. Um, if you had any advice for, you know, other entrepreneurs are going to be watching this and they're going to be thinking, you know, I want to sell my startup, um, maybe a micro require. If you had like any tips, like if you go back, um, what are some things, um, you know, you recommend, uh, potential entrepreneurs like prepare for or know about, um, to successfully get acquired? Yeah. Um, I think for us, it was just like knowing what you want. Um, so for us, we, we were, I think at first we were just like, we don't know, we didn't know if we wanted to sell the company or if we wanted to keep it cash flowing in the background while we were there, um, or not. And so, we were just kind of like on the fence of what we wanted to do. And the interest is what kind of um, uh, like led us to go down that path. And I'm glad we did. Um, but it probably would have been a little bit better for us if we're just like, oh, like this is what we want. Like we, we would prefer, you know, something in this offer range. Uh, we would prefer to get out in 60 days. Like we kind of actually had to like 
have these discussions along the way uh, between Ben and I to be like, how long should we, like, how long do we even want to be a part of this business as part of the transition? Like what's all this stuff? And I think if we would have kind of knew that, known that stuff between the two of us ahead of time, it would have been a little bit easier for us, but um, I'd say that. And then just making sure like our finances and stuff were up to date. Like we were pretty good about it um, and had like our accounting and all that stuff up to date. But I mean, that's the stuff that people poke around with. Like we had some like kind of company overview decks and like what our partnerships were and our contracts all there because those two perpetual licensing deals that we did before required us to do just a crap ton of due diligence. So we had this data room of um, of uh, all of our financials, all of our contracts and all that stuff, luckily already ready. Um, so when somebody was like, Hey, you know, we want to sign an LOI and go through due diligence. We're like, sweet. We, we actually just did this. Um, so for us, we had the due diligence stuff like kind of buttoned up and ready to go already. I think most people probably wouldn't, but I would recommend that. Um, and then two is just making sure that you know what you want. Um, because once you know what you want, then it becomes really easy to say, um, Hey, thanks for the offer, but you know, that's not, that doesn't kind of meet what I like. Um, or it's like, Hey, that sounds great. Like you seem like a great home for the business that I spent the last few years on. And, um, and also that like, it also meets like the financial needs that I need from this. It also meets the transition time um, and that sort of thing. And some people want to stay in the business a little bit, have some ownership and that sort of thing. And um, just knowing that stuff up ahead of time, like realistically what you are actually okay with, um, I think it's super important to know upfront um, yeah. rather than kind of figuring it out as you go. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. And buyers appreciate that too. Because they're wondering that exact same question, like, what do you want? And so being able to articulate even just kind of like a range, like, hey, you know, 300 to 500, um, we're open to this amount of transition, we're open to staying in the business, um, like, like really kind of being like upfront, like we're looking to sell the business, it just makes it much easier on a buyer so they don't have to kind of guess that. Yeah, um, I think there's your... your negotiables and non-negotiables um, because they're like, Hey, like, you know, this is not negotiable. We need to get out in 60 days if that's what you need, because we're working on this new business. Um, but what we are able to work on is a, you know, consulting agreement beyond that or whatever else. I think that's super helpful to know what your negotiables and non-negotiables are. Nice. What would you say? Um, like the hardest part of due diligence was like, what, what's like one part, like as a founder, like, Hey, get ready for this part. Um, it's going to take a ton of time. So maybe prepare in advance. Yeah. Um, so we had some contracts that we had to deal with. And so we had to kind of go through each of those and basically explain what our commitments were, um, where, like, because some of we had a two year contract with one of them. And we we're like, here's what we're actually obligated to do. If you take over the business, here's what you are now obligated to do. Here are things you're potentially not obligated to do. And like, I'll be completely honest, we didn't know all of those off the top of our head um, just because we had been with that you know with some of those customers for a while and um, and if you know the new person who's coming in to run the business wanted to increase prices on them could they because they're the new owner of the business versus is the contract part of the um, uh, the whole deal or, or that sort of thing and so we just didn't know some of that stuff um, and I think it would have been helpful to know that a little bit better like when you're actually putting together your due diligence stuff. But again, we were a little bit lucky because we put together a lot of the due diligence for some of those perpetual licensing deals that we did. But um, man, it, it it can be a little bit of a beast if you don't have that stuff up and running. So like if you use QuickBooks and you have all your accounting taken, taken care of, or you know, you're using Stripe or you know, bare metrics or whatever, and you can just kind of hand that stuff over, a lot of the due diligence can get done super quick. Um, so if you're kind of using stuff like that, I would recommend using as much kind of tooling as you can to kind of just like be able to hand that stuff over. Um, but like we had some contracts and stuff that we needed to kind of make sure we had to check with our lawyers. Like, what did we actually like sign here two years ago? Like what, yeah. you know, what is the implications for the the buyer? And then their lawyer has to look it over and um, that sort of thing. So that's the biggest thing is kind of check marking those sorts of things. But I mean, if you're using like a Stripe or a, you know, bare metrics or chart mobile or whatever, um, it's really helpful to hand that stuff over and like the due diligence on like the financial stuff can get done really quickly if you have that um, in place, which luckily we did. Yeah, I've noticed um, we have data around um, sort of that connect Stripe or bare metrics or any sort of analytics uh, within MicroCore. They get like 500% more buyer requests because it really cuts down on the due diligence of the buyer. Yeah, it's pretty hard, pretty hard to fudge those numbers when it's just being automatically piped in. 
Yeah. Um, and so what I love about your story though, is, so you had a company, um, you sold it for free quarter million dollars, man. Like that's awesome. Um, like I'm super stoked on that, but I think it's, it's, um, the better half of this is now you're working on, um, uh, a new company, um, that I assume you're more excited about and maybe you believe has, um, you know, more upside. Do you want to maybe, um, talk about, um, your new company and what it does and sure. um, what you're doing with that? Yeah. So I mean, but with the sale of median, um, both with that and then the, the licensing deals that we did kind of all combined that ended up being close to 2 million bucks. The perpetual licensing deals were actually bigger than the acquisition price, um, which actually is kind of what lowered, lowered some of the recurring revenue we had, but um, also kind of showed a pathway for upside for a buyer who was going to take it over is like, Hey, you could buy this company for 300 K and we have evidence that there are at least some buyers out there who would pay a one, uh, one time fee of 500 K or 750 K um, to actually have this technology. If they could just completely white label it. Um, those are huge contracts. Yeah. yeah. And so, so nicely done. Did you close those? Oh yeah. Yeah. We closed those before we sold the company. And so once we closed those deals was when we actually decided we want to sell it remaining assets of the company because we were like, oh, this is kind of like our mini exit already. Um, so let's let's see if we can, you know, kind of clear our minds completely of the company while we go to work on the new business. And so once we had done that, because, um, you know, 300K is a great outcome, especially for a lot of people, but uh, kind of cumulatively, we, we made, we kind of banked personally much more than that, um, which was great. And so that allowed us to start um, kind of figuring out what our next, you know, kind of swing at this thing was going to be because we're going to, you know, we're shitty employees. So we have to start a new company and do it all over again. And this time we wanted to swing bigger. And so, you know, kind of uh, company number two is a venture backed company called Workshop. Um, we focus on internal communications in particular. And so, um, you know, myself and my other partner from uh, Median are, are two of the partners. And then um, two of the folks that we worked with at a previous company called uh, Flywheel, which exited for a large sum of money, um, all got back together. The four of us started the company and raised some money. And, you know, this time, instead of the bootstrap route, we're going the venture capital route and kind of, you know, we hit our single and we're trying to, you know, swing for the fences on this one. And, um, you know, kind of internal communications I, at companies is, is, a, is a big, uh, big market. And so uh, it's something that we actually did um, previously at our previous companies before Median and, um, so we're really passionate about it and we've got a kind of good crew of getting the band back together and, and uh, you know, kind of what you did at micro acquire, getting the old team back together. It's, that's what we're yeah. doing too. So it's, yeah. you know, and so it's fun. I'll put a link, um, to your new company, um, in, in the notes, um, below on this, but, um, I, I love that path and it's kind of a similar path to me too. Um, you know, I sold business apps and that was kind of a, you know, win. And then now uh, MicroQuire has investors. I bootstrap business apps, um, investors with MicroQuire, but it allows me the freedom to kind of, you know, swing bigger because you have more experience. Um, you know, you're more confident in being able to, you know, build a larger size company. So um, congrats to you, Derek. That's freaking awesome, man. Um, I guess uh, final questions. Um, uh, who's your favorite entrepreneur? And you can't say Elon Musk. Uh, I don't think I, 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 I don't think I, Elon I, would be mine anyway. I do that to everybody because I used to. Uh, everyone would always say Elon. I'm like, no, no more Elon. Oh man, that's a uh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I actually like. There's some. Uh, there's a lot that the entrepreneurs I like the most are actually folks that I get to see really closely. And so, um, actually, just in the offices that are kind of next to me uh, are some companies that. Um, have kind of been grinding out for a while. You know, they just raised um, some money from like one of the companies just raised from Greylock and one of the other companies just raised from like a larger fintech company. Like I get to just sit and talk to those guys quite often and uh, we're in completely different industries, but um, is, uh, uh, I, I won't show their names because they haven't uh, done their funding announcements yet. Uh, and so I don't want to steal any thunder from them. Uh, but the two guys that are in the offices next to us, one runs a fintech company, one runs a blockchain company. Um, are the two people that I talk to all the time and you just see them and you're like, they're exceptionally sharp people. They're great at building teams. Um, you know, my current business partner, Dusty Davidson is our CEO of workshop. Um, and was previously the CEO of flywheel, which had a great exit. So I get to work side by side with him every day. 
um, as well. And so, you know, those are the people that I like. Those are probably names like, you know, those aren't names that people probably think of as much, but um, I like it just because I get special access. Uh, I like Andrew Gazdecki too. That guy's pretty legit. <laughs> yeah, he's he's all right. Well, um, your, your story is one of my favorite. And I, I just want to thank you for, um, you know, you were, your deal was one of those moments for me because when your deal closed, it was just me running the company entirely for free. Like, and then you post, I remember when your company came in, I was like, this is a really badass company. Um, and then when you told me someone was um, acquiring it, I was like, holy shit, this is, you were kind of like the micro car moment of, this really works. Like people, like there's well, buyers, like, like people actually will like buy a company for a quarter million dollars without like, you know, a broker involved paying 15%. This is insane. Well, that was my, like, after like we got a bunch of reach out, like right away, it was like, that was on my side. I was like, Oh, this really works. Uh, so it was kind of funny that on both sides of that, we're having kind of this moment of like, Oh, this really works because like, I, you know, like our product was cool. Like it was a, a niche product. I still use our product every day at our new company. Um, and so I'm like, there, this is cool. There is value here. Um, obviously it's we validated a, that a, through other people, but it's, it's a good product. Like I looked at yeah. it and I was like, I could see this being used for sales teams, support teams. Um, for those, um, you know, watching this, it, it, the way I kind of viewed it was like zoom without having to install it. So if you have a customer support person or a customer come on your website, you can, basically get into their browser and fix whatever issue. Oh yeah. Um, it's uh, you could be on a live chat with somebody. There's a button that just says view screen. And, and then you just click that button and it opens a new tab and you're just watching it. They don't have to accept anything, although you can ask for consent and all that stuff, which I'd encourage a lot of people to do. Um, but you can just watch it. They, they don't need to do anything, no downloads, anything. You just watch it. And it's, it's kind of like magic. The first time people see it, it was always hard to describe like what co-browsing means to people because people didn't know. And then I would show people and they'd be like, wow, this is like, this is crazy. You can do this. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of, you know, show people what the magic of that stuff is. Yeah. Another part I love about this acquisition story is um, the buyer, the buyer is super happy. Um, oh yeah. I, I won't mention his name, but we did a podcast too. And um uh, he's doing great and it sounds like your baby's, uh, in good hands. So, um, yeah, we, we keep in touch, uh, even though we're well past the 60 day transition, but we keep in touch. So it's like, I, I want to see that. I, my, my hope is that I look, you know, two, three, four or five years from now and median is worth 10 times what it was when we were running it, because I'm like, that'd be pretty cool. Even though we don't, we don't necessarily have the upside of that, but we, I mean, heck, we probably could have negotiated that in if we want to, um, you know, keep some small percentage ownership and that sort of thing. But, um, I, I would love to see um, it continue to succeed. I mean, we've obviously put a couple of years into that thing, but um, yeah, I, I, finding a, the buyer that also just kind of jives with what you hope your baby uh, can be and just kind of takes it further than you were able to, I think it's super important too. That's awesome. And wh when was that acquisition? It was, it had to be like a year ago, right? Yeah. Uh, almost exactly a year ago. Yeah. Sheesh. There's been a lot since then. Uh <laughs> yep. But um, I, I guess final question, um, any, any books you would recommend entrepreneurs reading? Mm, Podcasts, that's a good, anything? That's a good question. Uh, I, uh, I, I love my first million podcast is my favorite because I'm just like, I love hearing the ideas. You, I, you were on there. You actually mentioned Median as your favorite yeah, acquisition yeah, of all no, time. You, you guys are my favorite deal. Like, and, uh, and I didn't know that was coming. And I listened, I don't, you probably didn't even know that I listened to the podcast. So I was just listening. I'm like, what? that's us. Yeah. Um, so uh, I love that. Uh, you know, I've, um, I read, uh, I haven't read as many books as I wanted, uh, to in the last, you know, couple of years, I got, you know, young kids at home, but, um, I love podcasts. My first million is kind of like my, you know, business porn, like if people just riffing on ideas, like keeping the creative juices going. I love that. Um, I do have some, um, you know, business books. I, uh, I like to read around, like I'm trying to learn how to build like sales processes and stuff now, um, as we're a team of 10 and, we have to like build like a real sales pipeline and all that sort of thing. And so like the, um, you know, the book that HubSpot wrote on sales is really interesting. Is it um, a sales acceleration for formula by. Yeah. Yep. Mark. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember his last name, but uh, it's, oh, it starts with R, but that, that is a great book. Another yep. book I'd recommend is um, to sell as human and um, uh, from impossible to inevitable by Jason Lemkin and Aaron. Oh, Ross. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I have a different, uh, I think I have predictable revenue by Aaron Ross too, but uh, I got I mean, I'm trying to digest as much of that stuff as possible. So I love when if I read something in a book and then all of a sudden, like you make it, you, know, you make a sale the next day because of it or whatever. I'm like, well, that seems pretty tangible. So uh, I like that sort of thing too. Right on. Well, thank you so much for, you know, making the time, sharing the story. Um, super happy for you on your acquisition and your new company and uh, rooting for you uh, to succeed on both sides. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right. See you, Derek. See ya.